Uh, so first off, thank you for being here. I'm an East Coaster, so you know, in about 30 minutes, I'd normally be going to bed. But uh, hopefully, you're here for the right talk. It's uh, detection engineering in Kubernetes environments, and uh, we're going to talk about some logs. So just a quick intro about who I am. My name is Dakota Riley. I am the Vice President of Cloud Engineering at Acquia, uh, commonly confused with Aqua or Akia, but it's uh, Acquia. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about our company in a second, but uh, I describe myself as a you know, cloud security application security practitioner, and I love finding ways to automate those things and make them as easy as possible for people downstream. Uh, outside of cat, uh, or out, eh, I can't talk. Outside of work, I've got three cats back at home, I got married in April, and I play way too many video games and like working out. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. <laughs> so a uh, quick little intro about my employer who I'm here representing today. Um, so the easiest way to boil us down is we're a consulting company. Uh, we do a lot of public sector work around cloud security, application security, compliance, cloud infrastructure, the, the intersection of all those things together. And relevant to the talk, we actually do a lot of Kubernetes and kind of cloud native security work too, specifically with some of the uh, Department of Defense software factories and federal software factories. So just a kind of a quick little overview of the agenda of the talk. So the first thing I'll start out with is kind of some, some data points, right, on why you should build kind of Kubernetes detection engineering into your security backlog, right? Why spend the bandwidth doing it? Then we'll talk with about a kind of a high level threat model of what an attack cycle in a Kubernetes cluster might look like. And specifically, at least the two minimum data sources that you would need to get started detecting bad things in your clusters. Um, we'll talk about syscalls kind of at a high level overview. There's lots of good syscalls and runtime security content here today. Um, and on a more deeper level, we'll talk about Kubernetes audit logs, right? And from that point, we'll talk about how to get started writing your own detection cases, you know, like what kind of mindsets you want to apply to that. Uh, where to look for inspiration and what not to do. And then at the end of the talk, we'll actually look at some real world examples where we look at logs, we'll look at you know, the actions that generate them, their common uh, you know, uh, known true positive use cases and how to bring them down to a low uh, a ratio of false positive. So since we're talking about detection engineering, right? Uh, one thing that I find important when you kind of start to think about what types of activity you want to detect is are the things that I'm wanting to detect actually happening in the real world, right? You know, are people actually attacking Kubernetes clusters or attacking the control plane? And there's two real kind of data points I wanted to throw in here for the talk. So the first, and I want to throw this one with a caveat because um, it's not the end all be all for anything and I definitely don't recommend you make heat maps for it, but uh, is MITRE ATT&CK and specifically MITRE ATT&CK for containers. And the interest, the data point, that I would, the reason I would point to this is because uh, if you don't know what MITRE ATT&CK is, it's basically like a repository of what are called TTPs, tactics, techniques, and procedures. And the criteria for something to be added to MITRE ATT&CK is it has to have been observed happening in the real world, right? Um, so it makes it a good starting point for, hey, if this activity is in there, maybe we should have a detection for it. Don't make a heat map. Um, <laughs> I'll say that a few times in the talk. But uh, specific to Kubernetes, there's actually an entire containers matrix that has TTPs relevant to container orchestrators. And most of those techniques have sub-techniques that tie back to Kubernetes specific technologies themselves. The second, uh, a little more specific data point is, and I actually found this when I was uh, putting together the talk, is there was an academic study done by the University of California, Santa Barbara. And the, the easiest way to sum up what they did is they took different container orchestrator technologies, including Kubernetes, exposed them to the internet, and watched what happened, right? And, uh, the gist of what happened was is there were automated attacks against the exposed Kubernetes cluster. Basically, they were crawling the control plane API, trying to create pods, trying to create uh, uh, service account requests, uh, trying to create a foothold in the cluster. Uh, but the other thing that was interesting to me as a practitioner is they kind of went beyond that. And they also exposed the kubelet API, which you really shouldn't do. But there were automated attacks against that too, which to me implies that adversaries out there have a you know, higher than baseline understanding of Kubernetes and how to attack it. And with that, we'll you know, talk about you know, if I was an adversary, uh, what are potential paths I could take to compromise a Kubernetes cluster. And you know, for the purpose of the talk, this is probably boiled down to its most simplest form, right? I'm excluding like, you know, kind of crazy supply chain attacks, but really there are two, right? And the, you know, let's say we have a Kubernetes cluster that's running an application that we're exposing to the internet. The first would be 
is potentially exploiting that application to get code execution on the pod in the cluster, right? Um, you know, just because it's running on Kubernetes, that doesn't change if you don't patch your applications or, you know, uh, build them securely. That's always a threat, right? The second would be uh, basically attacking legitimate access to get access to the control plane, right? And where these get a little more interesting is typically in, you know, the life cycle of a real kill chain, you're probably moving laterally between the two, right? Maybe you compromise that application, you found a service account token on the pod, and you start trying to see what it has access to. Are there certain secrets it can it read? Can it create its own resources? Or vice versa, maybe you compromise a developer endpoint or a CI CD pipeline that has access to the cluster control plane, and now you're using that to see if you can exec into containers to see if there's you know, anything interesting you could find that would give you another lateral movement point. So great, uh, you just listed a bunch of problems. Uh, this is not an offensive security talk, it's a detection engineering talk. What do we do with that? How do we get started detecting all that, right? And the first step really comes down to having the appropriate data sources to actually detect things against that. And those two things are at a minimum, right? This is not a mutually exclusive list, but this is, if you're starting from nothing, that would be some sort of runtime capability, you know, basically something that instruments and detects syscall-based activity and the Kubernetes audit logs themselves. So uh, starting with our overview, right, we'll, we'll start with syscalls first, but the easiest way from a capability standpoint to explain what, you know, like a runtime threat detection tool or something that observes syscalls provides to us is that what's going on in my containers? Why is my container suddenly reaching out to pool.miner.xmr.whatever, right? Um, and the easiest example that I threw up here and is, you know, if I were to foolishly as an attacker on this netcat command to connect back to my obviously not evil C2 server, uh, we could uh, observe the actual OS level activity that's going under by looking at the syscalls that it's making. Uh, this is obviously a greatly abbreviated list if you've recently ran strace on that cat, so uh, don't hold me to that. But uh, from a detection engineering standpoint, you're usually not directly interfacing with syscalls. The reality is, like, if you're a practitioner at a company implementing this stuff, you probably don't have time, and if you do, you're probably a contributor to one of these awesome projects, right? Um, that said, you know, even though we're consuming existing tools, uh, the reality is that there's still detection engineering work that actually has to happen, right? You don't just throw a tool in your environment and suddenly all your runtime security woes are solved, right? Uh, those tools, you know, especially runtime security tools, typically lack the context of where that container's running, what's running on it, right? Who deployed it, who owns it? And on top of that, those alerts that get generated, they have to be properly prioritized. They have to be routed to the person that can actually do something about that. And depending on what type of company or organization you work at, that answer is gonna be different, right? It, you know, at a larger enterprise, it might be your SOC. Um, you know, at a more cloud native organization, you might have like a cloud engineering team or an SRE team that actually owns that capability, right? Uh, the other thing too, and speaking from experience on implementing these, they're just by nature noisy. And they have to be because they have to bias towards you know, alerting on something that might be potentially malicious, right? So there's a lot of effort that goes into like tuning those rule sets. Um, you know, one common example that I've dealt with is that we would instrument these on clusters. And we would have clusters that would run both uh, built applications and CI pipeline jobs for building those applications. And the, the reality is the runtime activity uh, between those things is very, very different. One is running a, you know, compiled binary with a hopefully, I shouldn't say super static, depends on what your application's doing, but relatively static set of behaviors the other is reaching out to repositories, pulling down artifacts, compiling files, and uh, the same rule sets don't run nicely on those, right? Uh, the other strategy I've kind of seen success with, and you know, you have to have a sim that's capable of supporting this type of activity, is instead of doing one-for-one -one alerting on these types of alerts, you would try to cluster them, whether that's you know by pod, by namespace, by time span, and alert if you know the number of alerts or findings breaches a certain threshold or you could go a risk-based alerting type of route if it matches a certain pattern of activity, like certain parts of the kill chain. <clears throat> so enough about syscalls. It's time to talk about audit logs, right? So Kubernetes audit logs are basically just a recording of your interactions with the control plane. So when you're you know, applying a manifest, you're hitting the API server, you're creating, reading, updating, and deleting resources, right? So one thing to note 
and a lot of this is dependent on you know what type of Kubernetes cluster you're running, whether you're running your own, you're running you know a, a, a cloud service provider managed offering. But these are not on by default. Uh, there's the lovely little picture you're looking at here. It's called an audit policy, and this actually one has to be turned on via an API server flag, and then two specified um, with the audit policy of what you want to log and how much detail you want to log it out at, right? And you know, I'll spend a second talking about this in a little more detail. There's really kind of two, I would say, parameters that you definitely want to know and understand from this, um, if not becoming you know, a full expert on audit log policy. And the first is log level, right? So there's three log levels. There's metadata, request, and request response. And you know, basically, if I have a rule in this audit log policy, that that log level will indicate how much information I get on that request being made. So if I have only a log level of metadata, I'm only going to see the API call that was made, whether it was successful. There's some other high level metadata fields and you know like source IP and user identity. Uh, when we start to look at request and request response, that's where we can see the actual raw API call that the user passed into the server and what this, what configuration the server actually applied. Uh, the next, and this one's a little interesting too, is stages. So by default, or if you have all these on, when you say if you make a call to the control plane to create a pod, right, it's a single API call, uh, if you have all three stages set, you'll actually get either two or three audit log events for that single call. Because there's, there's basically three stages. There's request received, response started, which I believe only replies to um, watch actions, and then response complete. Um, so you run the risk of potentially you know, doubling or tripling your log volume, which if you're paying for your SIM vendor, uh, you know, I know some of us have seen those ingest bills, they're expensive, right? And uh, in a couple slides later, I'll talk about which one has the most security value. And then finally, because this is a security talk and I, I just felt the need to mention it, you can actually accidentally configure this to log sensitive values. So think about your resource types, like your secrets, your config maps, which hopefully don't have secrets in there, or even if you have custom resource definitions that have certain sensitive properties, if you've configured them to log their full request, that'll actually be reflected in your logs, right? Um, and a good example, if you look at the managed cloud providers, they, you can't control this on your own, um, but they provide the audit log policy they provide or that they configure for you, and you can see that they've exempted those out. All right. I promised the logs, so um, we're just gonna, you know, I'm not gonna go through every single field, right, but we have to look at, you know, an example of an audit log, and we'll just look at the high-level pieces of information we can get out of this and where we can find it. So the first is those metadata fields I was talking about, right? Um, you know, at a high level, there's basically the what log level and what stage this request was made at. There's an audit ID, which really is useful from a, like a troubleshooting perspective. Like if you're trying to figure out where an event went where before it got to your SIM, you could technically query that same ID before it made it downstream. And then there's request URI and verb, right, which is the actual API call you made and the method you used to make it. The next is, you know, who made this request and how did they make it, right? So there's a user key field that actually uh, tells us, you know, what authenticated principal made this request. Um, and there'll be some information about what groups they're a part of, what permissions they have, or, you know, maybe they're an unauthenticated user. Um, hopefully we didn't accidentally expose our control plane to the internet, but, you know, stranger things have happened. Uh, <laughs> you'll, you'll also see that there is the IP address field and the user agent field, which gives you information about where they're making the call from, right? Is it coming from in your cluster? Is it coming from a developer workstation somewhere out in the internet? And if it's not a malicious request, you can kind of glean how they're making that call on the user agent. In this case, there's a really outdated version of kubectl, but you know, maybe they're using Terraform or the Go SDK. Um, on any request, we can see what resource this request is particularly targeting with the object ref field. Um, was it successful? What status code got actually returned from the server, which is important, right? Because we can write detections on, you know, if there's a bunch of failed or unauthorized calls, right? That might tell us that somebody's trying to brute force permissions. And this one kind of ties back to when I was talking about logging levels, where you have request and request response. This is actually where we would see the raw request. So in this case, this is a request for creating a, you know, if this was a request for creating a pod, 
we could actually see the full manifest of that pod reflected in this. And then under the response, we can see what the server actually applied. Uh, Timestamps, right? You know, knowing when a request was made is pretty important to like a security in investigation or detection. And finally, you know, if you're using things like admission controllers, right, uh, they can actually add annotations to requests. You know, if they modified something or denied it outright, um, which you know, this is kind of environment dependent, but it's helpful context. So just kind of some high level notes on audit logs and dealing with audit logs. And the first thing is out of the box, they, they just generate a lot of volume. And the reason is, is that you know, the, a lot of the internal Kubernetes controllers, they, they call the control plane API, right? So it's generating noise. And that, that tends to be useful for like a debugging or you know, if you're building a feature on Kubernetes perspective. But if you're trying to detect just general malicious activity, a lot of times that's just extra noise and volume downstream for your sim or your data lake or wherever you're sending this to, right? Um, the next thing is when I was talking about stages and which one is the most valuable from a security perspective, uh, you know, throughout the process of doing all this and you know, building detections and all that stuff, I found really request complete uh, provides you what you need. Uh, and the reason being is you know, request received and response started. I, again, I think it's the same kind of idea that if you're developing functionality for Kubernetes, it's great to be able to see if a request got fully processed, but from a detection standpoint, we still get whether you know, that request was a 401 instead of a 200. Um, we also get the original time the request was remade with the uh, request received timestamp field, even in the uh, response complete stage. And you know, finally, right, depending on where you're running Kubernetes, you have to understand that you might not control the audit policy. So when you're going to build these detections for this activity, you can go look at the audit policy that's being applied by your cloud service provider and you know, understand if the thing you want to detect is going to be logged in the first place. All right, um, so now we're gonna talk about you know, how to get started generating detection cases, right? And I think the first and probably the most important you know, kind of step to getting started in this is understanding the norms of your environment, right? I think this goes further than you know, anything, than MITRE ATT&CK, than pretty much any framework out there, right? Like you have to ask, what's normal in my environment? How do we deploy? Do we use GitOps end to end? Do people just kubectl, apply F? Is it something in between, right? Um, you know, how do we organize our expression of the software development life cycle? Where's our production environment? Uh, what tools do we use to do all that, right? You know, like that's any deviation from that is definitely like potentially a cause for concern. And, you know, just how do we organize our environment? How do we organize our namespaces? What gets its own cluster? Does everything get its own cloud account? And the thing that's really interesting about knowing all this stuff is not only can you use this as context to uh, augment your more kind of threat detection type rules, you can also develop rules off of these things and deviations off of these things, which might clue you into something that's kind of strange. Uh, the next thing that I'd recommend looking at is uh, offensive tooling that's out there, right? So um, two examples that I love to point to because they're specifically adversary emulation tools, which means they're um, basically incorporating those TTPs I mentioned are you know, Stratus Red Team, which actually has a module for uh, Kubernetes and Kubernetes tactics. Uh, and then you have Atomic Red Team, which is really meant more at the OS layer, but it's great for if you want to emulate, you know, container level TTPs and detections for those, right? The next two are more uh, pen testing tools, and the difference is, is that a lot of times in detection engineering, people want to bias towards what's been proven to be actually used by adversaries, but one challenge I've found when you're writing detections for cloud or cloud native is there's just not a lot of data out there, right? You know, stuff is so new and cutting edge that, you know, I think there's some value in still looking at even things that might be kind of more pen testing focused and looking at writing detections for those. Um, you know, like Pyrenees is a great example where there's a command in there that you can uh, run exec on tons of different pods. Say if you wanted to steal a service account token from 50 pods at once, right? That's a pretty great detection candidate if you ask me. And then finally, you know, looking at adversary emulation frameworks for inspiration, right? Not, not heat map coverage or anything like that. Uh, MITRE ATT&CK is a pretty awesome starting point for feeding into detection cases or a threat model. Um, you'll notice I'm mentioning two matrices here, and the goal is not to just say, look at all these matrices, but um, the Microsoft threat matrix is really interesting because uh, MITRE ATT&CK and the MITRE ATT&CK for containers matrix was built to accommodate any container orchestration technology. So the techniques there can apply to ECS, Docker Swarm, um, whatever other container orchestrator, right? But the uh, threat matrix for Kubernetes, if you go look at it in here, almost everybody would probably be familiar with the tactics on there because they're written, you know, it's like 
uh, hit the secrets API or exec into a pod. They're very technology specific. And then finally, you know, uh, threat modeling your environment and writing up attack trees specific to your environment. And before we start talking about you know, our actual you know, log examples and how to detect them and make them better, you know, I wanna talk about common pitfalls as you go through this process of building detections. And the first and probably my favorite is we already have a preventative control for this, right? And my response to that is great. This is an amazing detective control because if this ever fires, it's gonna be really high fidelity because that means something weird is going on. Either uh, our preventative control got turned off, it's not actually configured the way we thought it is, or something strange is going on here, right? So it's, it, it, it's something that happens all the time, but I, I'm like, you, you need both in reality, right? The second is, and th there's some value into thinking from this perspective is that you know, an attacker would just do this instead. Um, and, and the reality is like a lot of this has to be informed by kind of the threat model and risk posture of your organization. You know, not everybody is dealing with nation state or APT level threats. And even then, attacker sophistication varies and attackers make mistakes too, right? So just because you have a detection that's simplistic in nature and might be able to be circumvented, it's not necessarily bad as long as you've considered that and know that. All right, um, finally we've got our uh, detection cases. So the, the way I formatted these is there's basically just an upfront slide where I'll talk about what the thing is, what its legitimate usage is, because the reality is when you're building detections against you know, cloud and cloud technologies, most of the time it's abusing legitimate functionality in unintended ways. There's not really secret hidden ways to, to do things. I mean, there are, but um, so that tends to lead to a lot of false positives, right? So I'll talk about what its legitimate usage is, uh, what its attack purpose is, I'll show a log sample, and then we'll talk about um, how to detect off that log sample, and then also how to uh, enrich that so you don't have 50 million false positives from a particular rule. So the first, uh, and this is the one I, I really like because it also serves as kind of an enforcement of like privileged access, is uh, detecting direct access to production via the exec command. So the exec command is just a capability on Kubernetes that lets you get a running shell or run a command on a running pod or a container, right? And it's very common for you know return to service operations or break glass or troubleshooting, right? You know production's down, you need to get in there and look at it. Um, it can also be an anti-pattern if somebody's directly changing things and not codifying them, right? From the uh, attacker perspective, it's a great execution or lateral movement tactic in that you know I have Kubernetes credentials, I'm going to start in interacting with the compute layer, or I want to look around different containers and see if there's other credentials or other connections I can reach and interact with, right? So off of the audit log how do we actually detect this, right? So you're looking at an audit log that's generated from the kubectl exec command, and the real core thing there is that you'll see that the action that we're taking in the uh, object ref is against the pods resource, but there's a sub resource of exec, right? And this is a create verb, so we're creating an exec session. Um, the interesting thing about this one is that you can actually, and it's not expressed anywhere else in the request, except request URI. Um, you can actually get the request, uh, the command that was passed into the request out of there. It's if you look really closely, it's URL encoded, so you can actually see our bin bash in there, um, and that's like a really valuable and useful piece of context because, you know, if you see something like cat, like a var service account token, right? That's really strange. As opposed to this, this is somebody probably logging into troubleshoot prod, right? So great, we turn this on. It's really noisy. How do we make it better? And you know, one of the easiest ways to do this is make your detection rules actually aware of what your production environment is, right? Whether that's a cluster or a cloud account and either downscale or upscale the severity based on that or don't alert, right? If this is normal activity in dev. And you know, on top of that, also understanding your access patterns at your org. So um, one thing we actually did is we baked in context of our on-call rotation into our detection rule because you know, if there's an active incident and somebody's on call, this is probably normal or accepted activity, right? Uh, and the other thing you can approach it with is an abnormal rate of the calls, right? So if this happens you know, 500 times in one second, that's strange and probably worth a human looking at as a potential indicator of compromise. So the next one, and this is one probably everybody in the room knows, right, because it's pretty infamous is, you know, launching a privileged container, right? So in Kubernetes, uh, you can run privileged containers which have access to the underlying capabilities on the node and 
Um, while it's not great, there are legitimate use cases for this. And ironically, there's a lot of runtime security tooling that has a need to do this still today, you know, to listen to syscalls on the nodes, right? Um, there's also certain workload types that might need it. But um, it's a very infamous privilege escalation tactic where I, as an attacker, have a limited set of pr privileges. I find out I'm able to create a container, and the privilege flag is uncontrolled to me, right? Um, so in this case, this is a create pod event, and this one is one where you have to actually be logging the full request object to see this. And you'll basically see in the request object that there's a field of security context of privileged is true. So, and this one is pretty near and dear to my heart because this is such a common detection, but it's also a common false positive too, um, filtering out all the noise on it, right? Um, the first and easiest way to start to tune this down is to inventory all the tools that you know or images you know absolutely have to need this in your environment, right? So if you're redeploying a cluster, you won't fire this because your chosen runtime security tool is getting redeployed, right? Um, also, is this a new deployment? Has this image been deployed with a privileged configuration before? Um, who deployed it, right? Uh, that's also a, a potential piece of context. And, um, this is one, this one's a little harder to do programmatically um, that I haven't fully figured out yet, but is, was it an actual escalation of privilege, right? Because when this is advantageous to an attacker is they have a limited set of privileges and they want to actually get more, right? If they're already an admin on the Kubernetes cluster and they're creating a privilege pod, they're not doing themselves any favors. They could just exec into the container to begin with. And last but not least, uh, retrieving all secrets, right? So, you know, we all know the Kubernetes secret resource and it's just a mechanism for providing secrets objects to your workloads, right? Um, but uh, it's, it's a credential access tactic. You know, say you've gotten code execution on a pod and you find a service account token. This is probably gonna be one of the first things you try to see if there's secrets you can access. Um, so this one's a little interesting for me, at least me coming from some of the cloud providers uh, in that the actual API for looking at the uh, existence of a secret and accessing its value is the same API, right? It's all just whether you're getting all the fields or not. But the way to detect it is you're doing a list call against secrets and you're not specifying a namespace. So great, you turn this on and it's this is very noisy without like filtering out or doing anything to you know reduce the noise, right? And the first thing you have to do is there's a lot of internal Kubernetes components that actually have to watch secrets because there's secrets they use internally. You have to allow us those, right? Um, the second thing is constraining it to, you know, requests that don't specify a specific namespace or label selectors because technically you could specify label selectors and not get the secret value. Um, and then the last one I would say that's really important is, is this a human doing this or a workload? Um, and a workload is, definitely a much more indicator of compromise because you'll get so much more context that you have a you know an application running as a pod it's had no history of accessing the secrets API there's been no code changes and suddenly it's trying to access the secrets API with you know a 401 or a 403 right um, definitely kind of uh, you know a red flag from a security perspective <laughs> all right um, that's the talk, so if there's anything you take away from this talk, I would say, you know, don't sleep on audit logs for detection use cases, right? You know, if you're using Kubernetes heavily at your organization, you know, get those logs in, you know, build useful detections in your backlog. And, you know, the last thing I would say too is all those pieces of context, try to bake those into your detections. Don't make an analyst go and get a rule that fires 50 times a day and then have to go look all this stuff up instead, automate it in there. Um, so that's the talk. Thanks for sticking with me to the end of the day. Um, love to connect. You know, if you enjoy the talk, connect me on LinkedIn. I'll be at the happy hour. Thank you so much.